professor always knows when a hush comes over the audience, it's time to move. So welcome to the second uh, Burgess Lecture Series for fall 2010. I'd like to welcome back uh, Jack Burgess and his lovely wife, Margaret, uh, who's with us tonight. Uh, with a I'm Professor Pat Murphy, and uh, I'd like to introduce our speaker to you. Uh, you can see his name and title is up there. Uh, Chairman, President, and CEO of Smith Buckland Corporation, largest association management professional services company in the U.S. He was with Smith Buckland from 1983 to 1996 and left for a few years and came back in 2002 as CEO. And Henry calls it the proudest moment of his career. He led a transfer of the company's ownership from its financial investors to its employees. Now it's 100% uh, employee owned. Henry is a dedicated and ongoing student of leadership, which we're obviously going to hear about tonight. His thoughts on leadership uh, has been profiled in several books, including one called On My Honor, I Will. Uh, it's uh, written by Randy Pennington. And Prior to rejoining Smith Buckland, he served as chairman, president, and CEO of Courtlink Corporation. Henry has an MBA from the University of Chicago and a bachelor and, and master's from uh, Cornell. Please join me in giving a Notre Dame welcome to Henry Givre. I've been a passionate student of leadership as long as I can remember. I'm simply in awe of the power and impact of great leaders and the profound difference one person can make. Examples abound throughout history of men and women whose courage and words and convictions indelibly shaped the lives of people, the outcome of events, and even the course of nations. Okay. I admit, as business people, our pursuits are perhaps a bit humbler in scope. Nevertheless, anyone in a position of power or authority of responsibility who also happens to be an effective leader can have a lasting impact on the lives of people and the success and vitality of the organization he or she serves. You know, the, um, the current economic crisis certainly will be remembered as the most punishing in over 70 years. And over the last couple years, I think it's safe to say that pundits and so-called experts have bombarded us with opinions and advice on how to deal with the economic downturn. Now, there are some useful research and some sound perspectives and certainly some innovative ideas, but come on, it's enough to make my head explode. The fact is, in the end, there's no playbook, there's no instruction manual that guarantees success for an organization dealing with uncertain, difficult times. But there is one sort of compelling and powerful certainty that stands out. And that is that leadership is the one imperative that enables everything else within an organization and its people. And so when all the noise dissipates, when all the ideas du jour come and go, there is a fundamental, indisputable truth that leadership is the uniquely consistent and defining force behind great, enduring enduring organizations. And leadership is recession-proof. Leadership is eternal and without qualification. And the principles of leadership are timeless and perhaps never more timely than today. Oh, and by the way, during difficult, uncertain times of crisis, true leaders are revealed and false leaders are exposed. Now, it is true that leadership is one of the most observed phenomena in the world. And there has been so much written on the topic of leadership. I don't know about you, but most of these books that are coming out, 
to me are a bit gimmicky, a little weird. There's some good ones, my favorite being you know, leadership lessons from Santa Claus. So what is leadership? We know when we see it, we can measure its impact, and we can feel how it inspires us. But somehow, trying to define leadership, it's an elusive concept, and every attempt at trying to define leadership somehow feels inconclusive and indeterminate. I wrote an article in Business Week a few years ago where I said CEO and leader have mistakenly become synonymous. Nothing could be further from the truth. CEOs are judged by quantitative results. Leaders result in ordinary people doing extraordinary things. CEOs possess and develop strong skills in finance, negotiation, and marketing. Leaders are shaped and defined by character. CEOs create strategies and markets. Leaders create purpose and meaning in others. CEOs measure success in terms of earnings, market share growth, and stock price appreciation. Leaders measure success through the success of all of those they serve, including customers and employees, shareholders, and communities. And they live by a fundamental tenet that service to others is one of the highest honors and greatest obligations of a true leader. And the job of a leader fundamentally is to inspire and enable people to do great work and make valuable contributions and reach their utmost potential. And in the process, by the way, they build great, enduring organizations. Now, I'm sure you've all probably seen a take on this. If you haven't, you will. Sort of the difference between leadership and management. Let me share with you my thoughts on this. Managers, they plan, they coordinate. Right? They get things done. They're about getting things done and administering. They're about productivity and effectiveness and quality and systems and process. Pretty important stuff. Right? And management is by appointment, a promotion, a set of responsibilities. And you're in charge of something. Right? And it is vested in formal authority. Leadership, on the other hand, has three components, and it's different. There's a higher calling of leadership. The first component is that leaders visualize, they imagine something better about the future. They imagine a better state of affairs or conditions about the future. It could be something small, frankly. It could be an improved process somewhere. Or it could be something huge, like transforming a company, an organization. But leaders recognize they can't get there alone. They need others to get on board. So leaders inspire and enable others to get on board. And most importantly, they get there. Right? They have a relentless commitment to getting there, results and outcomes. Great leaders are also great managers. How many of you have heard the, somebody say, oh, I'm a leader, I'm not a manager, I'm visionary? Well, no, you're a visionary. Great, you can visualize something about the future. Fundamentally, great leaders are also great managers. If part of being a leader is getting there, then you have to have strong management capabilities and capacity. Oh, and by the way, leadership fundamentally is about change. Think about it. If you're visualizing something better about the future, by definition, leadership is about change. Now, what's interesting about leadership is you can't buy leadership. It's not something that you can grab. It's not about a title. It's not about your corner office. It's not the same as having authority. Leadership is invited and can only be given willingly by others based on who you are and what you do. And it's revealed by what you inspire and what you enable. You know, sometimes the funnies give us some interesting insights. 
The fact is, kind of by definition, a person with no followers is not a leader. Right? Now, I'm the CEO. I can sort of make you follow me if you want your job. Right? So there's sort of different kind of followers. There's sort of the reluctant compliance, but we're talking about passionate, dedicated, and engaged followers. Imagine December 25th, 1776. George Washington and his Continental Army have gotten their butts kicked in every single battle against the British. His army is decimated. Starvation, sickness, loss, death. Now imagine on December 25th, George Washington going around his army and saying, hey guys, let's get on this boat, these bunch of boats, cross this river in this driving sleet with ice on the river and attack this army that's five, six, seven, eight times bigger than us. Imagine his words and his actions leading up to that point, what they must have been for his men to have willing to follow him into battle. And of course, that was the Battle of Trenton. And that turned the war around and gave birth to our nation. Now, I'm going to share with you a pet peeve. Why is it that we use the term leadership to sort of define anyone in a position with a title, right, or set of responsibilities? In fact, oftentimes the word leader is a noun preceded by an adjective sort of designating or defining the individual's profession or industry, right? Business leader, political leader, community leader, company leader, world leader, executive leader. No, it should be the other way around, right? If you've earned it, leader should be the modifier if, in fact, you've earned the privilege of leading others. Leader executive, leader politician, leader business person. I think it's an insightful comment. For me, what it means, this is fundamental tenet, is that leadership can't be taught. It must be learned. There are no simple formulas. There are no set rules. There are no playbooks. There are only principles and concepts. Leadership must be learned through a, through a process of personal and active engagement and self-discovery. Or stated another way, earning the privilege of leading others is not, does not depend on who our teachers are or what books we read, but rather on what we do with the lessons learned. So our time together, I have three goals. The first, I want to share with you a working framework around defining and measuring leadership. The ideas and principles behind this framework are sort of drawn from my own personal journey of growing and learning and discovering. Number two, I hope to share a few practical ideas and thoughts that you can put into practice every day. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, I hope what I share with you this evening in some way resonates with you and I will have in some small way contributed to your own commitment and your own personal journeys of growth and self-discovery around leadership. But leaders do grow, they aren't born. So I want to just digress for one second and talk about growth. You know, growth is the only real sign of life. Think about it, we sort of accept that in the plant kingdom, right? We sort of look for signs of growth in the spring to see if a plant is alive, actually has sort of survived the winter. Well, the same is true with individuals and organizations. Growth is, the, is vital for life and vitality. Now, when most people think of growth, they think of the adding something, a new skill, a new knowledge, there's actually three dimensions of growth. There's the additive type, again, so you learn something new, a new piece of information, you develop a new skill. But shedding is part of growth. 
getting rid of old prejudices, old thinking, right? emotions, things that block the additive type of growth. You know, as CEO, one of the most important things that I do, actually any senior executive, is hiring other senior executives. A few years ago, I hired a senior executive, our chief information officer. Disastrous. Major issues. Not ethically, but just incompetence, major issues with clients. And it cost the company a hell of a lot of money to remediate. Major mistake. Obviously, I fired them. Now, what would highly achievement-oriented people do under those circumstances? You beat yourself up, right? OK. But beating oneself up adds nothing to getting on track to remediate. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not talking about accountability and repercussions. There were. There should be. I'm talking about the energy and emotion spent on beating oneself up. So how long should you beat yourself up? 24 hours. My management team said, how do you do that? Well, because I've learned over time that shedding is a critical component of growth. It's not like I lost brain cells overnight. I made a mistake, and there are repercussions, and there are accountabilities, and there were. But you got to move on. And lastly, and perhaps most importantly, leveraging one's own skills and talents and gifts are also part of growth. We've all known people, maybe some of you that are early in your career, maybe you haven't known too many people, who focus on their weaknesses their whole lives and end up having unsuccessful lives. Now, you sort of got to take care of your weaknesses. You can't let them get you into trouble. But all aspects of growth, an important aspect of growth, is leveraging one's own talents and skills and gifts. OK. Let me share with you the leadership framework. There are four domains. The first domain is who you are. I'm not talking about your public persona but who you are at the core. I'm talking about your spoken and lived values and your belief and assumptions and your dreams and aspirations. Abraham Lincoln was once asked, how long did it take him to write the Gettysburg Address? He said, all my life. People need to know who you are and what you believe before they allow you to lead them. If your actions and decisions and choices don't deeply and genuinely and consistently connect to your life story, people will know. And they will not give you permission to lead them. You're early in your career, many of you. Very few executives think about these things, again, deeply, and share this with those around them. Leadership is defined and shaped by character. I'm talking about the kind of character that inspires confidence and loyalty and trust, the kind of character that offers hope and gives strength to others, and the kind of character that invites and earns enthusiastic followers. Character is the sum total of your values and beliefs reflected in your behaviors Actions, decisions, and choices. Now, there's a lot of studies that have been done. Are we born with certain aspects of our character? Are we shaped because of our upbringing or events that have happened in our life? I think the latest research would say about 40% of who we are is scripted in our genes. OK, fine. 60% is by choice. Clearly. The events in our lives shape us, but it's our choice. That's 60%. It's our choice. What I'd like to share with you is what I believe are the 10 distinguishing qualities of great leaders, that define great leaders. And I do this not as a way to preach, but to suggest three things. One, find people who embody these tenets. Surround yourself with them. Study them. Model them. Two, it's a great gut check. Great, every time I do this presentation, I reflect as I prepare about these 
key qualities and how I'm living up to them. And lastly, I promise you, a little arrogant, I know, but I guarantee that living these tenets in words and with actions, faithfully practicing them without compromise, you will experience a level of contentment and fulfillment far more sublime than you could have ever imagined. OK, first one, sort of obvious stuff. Uncompromised integrity. The key word, uncompromised. Now, there's integrity on the big stuff, ethical things, but there's also integrity on perhaps what seems not as big, like giving a performance review to a subpar person on your team because you sort of want to, don't want to confront it or because you think it might be too difficult to replace that person. That sort of violates integrity, doesn't it? Or allowing others to speak ill of someone that you know is unfair, that sort of violates integrity as well. Uncompromised integrity in words and in action. Trust, key words, readily giving it as much as striving hard to earn it. Leaders fundamentally offer trust. I'm not talking about just blindly. I'm talking about those in their network of relationships and professional colleagues. Leaders start with trust. They believe in the integrity and the intentions of those in their network. Now, again, perhaps some of you earlier in your careers, you haven't had to deal with this as much. Hopefully you won't. But think about people that you don't have a trusting relationship. What happens? The smallest little issue is a big issue. Now, think about relationships with people that you have tremendous trust, small issues or non-issues. And big issues are opportunities for mutual problem solving. I want to share with you a personal story. <clears throat> and I didn't, and it was very personal, didn't share it with anyone until I was interviewed for a book called Apples Are Square, where the research, the authors researched a lot of different people and positions of responsibility, sort of trying to figure out what's the ideal 21st century leader. So they came and interviewed me, and they asked me 15 questions. One of the questions was around this, and I answered it. As it turned out, it ended up being a whole chapter in the book. When I, was, when I left Smith Buckland the first time, I should say the first time, the only time, when I left Smith Buckland in 1996, I got in the crazy world of dot-coms, and I was running an online services company in the legal industry. And we went through all the ups and downs. We were ready to go public, 2000. Some of you may remember the Dow dropped 400 points. Now it seems not that bad if you compare it to the last couple of years. But the financial markets completely collapsed. Public markets collapsed, couldn't go public. So we raised a bunch of money at ridiculous valuations. Great little company. It's, again, an online services company in the legal industry. But we couldn't get the ramp. In other words, we needed additional funding in order to, be, to get profitable. So we ended up doing a deal, beginning of a deal, started working to get a deal with LexisNexis, $2 billion legal services company. So we dealt with their attorneys. Everything came back. And we agreed to all the terms. Term sheet comes back. Everything's there. But they added, the CEO of Lexus added this one thing. Out of the proceeds, a million dollars to Henry Gervais. Wow. My management team said, Henry, you deserve this. The board unanimously approved the deal with the million dollar going to me. The CEO of Lexus wanted to make sure that I was sort of committed to get the deal done. I went home that night, and something just didn't feel right. First of all, they sort of held the gun to the company's head, to our board's head, because there weren't a lot of options. Two, I didn't need motivation, financial motivation, to get this deal done. I knew it was right for our employees and for our customers and for the shareholders, even though disappointing that it wasn't what it could have been if we had gone public. And most importantly, that million dollars was coming out of the shareholders, who had already sort of gotten slammed as we kept raising more and more money. So I went home that night, and I said to my wife, honey, I'm going to give this back. She said, what? No, she actually did. She was incredibly supportive. So the next morning, I announced 
that I'm giving the million dollars back. Lexus CEO said to me, exact words, you're an idiot. A couple of board members said, Henry, what are you doing? No one's going to remember this. Well, you know what? I would remember it. And I have to tell you that I don't regret it one bit. I mean that. The point is, fundamentally, I believe all of us as human beings know in our gut what the right thing to do is. It's just finding the courage to doing it. If you don't believe this, try this experiment. For the next two weeks, absolutely commit to this, no exceptions, and see people's reactions. They're going to think, oh my god, this person works on water. Because we so often see this. Always delivering on promises and commitments. Now, there are things that come up, but you got to make sure you communicate them. Right? You got to make sure you deal with the person that you're promising or committed to. What is it about us as adults? If you think about children, anyone who has children knows that they just speak their mind. So what is it about as we get older that we feel like we can't be open and straight? Obviously, you've got to have diplomacy and empathy. But not, resolve, not surfacing and resolving conflict at best prevents companies from unleashing a lot of human potential. And at worst, it can be a cancer within a, an organization. Yeah. Absolutely. How do you expect to capture people's hearts and inspire them if you don't genuinely care about them? How do you do that? So um, I'm a big football fan. And I grew up, still love the Cleveland Browns, and have had many, many Ah, seasons were not feeling too good, right? And of course, the Green Bay Packers were my nemesis growing up. Come to find out years later, no offense to anyone in here, Vince Lombardi, greatest football coach of all time. 1959, Vince Lombardi is in the locker room, first year. Packers have been, you know, losers every single year. And he says to his player, first of all, I want to thank you for allowing me to be your coach. Second, he said, Gentlemen, we are relentlessly going to chase perfection, even though we won't catch it because no one's perfect. But we are relentlessly going to chase it because in the process, we'll capture excellence. And then the story goes, he went up to everybody's face and said, I am not remotely interested in being just good. Accountability. You know, there's a difference between accountability and, and responsibility. Responsibility is about your duties, right, your role, what you're going to try to do. Accountability is an obligation and a binding pledge. Self-awareness. This is one of those that you don't think about very often. It's the balance of self-confidence and self-knowledge. Look, in any position of responsibility and authority, you're going to be making decisions on perfect information. You're going to be making judgment calls. You're going to have others second guess you. You're going to make mistakes. So self-confidence is critical. But self-knowledge is just as important. True self-knowledge, understanding your limitations, your weaknesses, genuinely and openly, and surrounding yourself with others that will tell you the truth before you start believing your own BS. Service to others is one of life's truest meanings and highest honors and greatest obligations. Now, think about the executives, the politicians, and others in power over the last couple years. Their deficiencies in terms of these attributes is stunning. Think about the scandals in the early 2000s, WorldCom and Enron. What was the reaction from the business community, from government, regulations? 
Like, hello, is it me? How about if we just ensure and do the same level of rigor due diligence on those individuals that we appoint to positions of power to look at their character and their values? Regulations. Right? What we're dealing with today, in my perhaps not so humble opinion, is not a failure in institutions, whether public or private. It's a massive, breathtaking failure of leadership. Second domain on the leadership framework. What you do, right? This is about your own performance, your own individual performance, the application of your natural talents, knowledge, and skills manifested through your behaviors, habits, and practices based on priorities of your, how you allocate your time. Now, there's a lot of things that as you go up the ranks and you gain more and more responsibility that you're going to do. I would suggest there are 21 essential things. Now, obviously, you don't have time to go through these this evening. But there are what I call the essential 21 of effective leadership. Years ago, when I was young, 31, 32, someone very wise said something to me that I'll never forget. He said, hey, you're a real smart guy. You're a real talented guy. And you're going to do things. You will do things much better in a lot of things than a lot of other people. The key question you all always want to ask yourself throughout your career, what are the things that only you can do based on your position or set of responsibilities? I'm the only one that can be a dad to my daughters. Better not delegate that. It's the same thing with leadership. There are certain things that only a leader can do. Have to focus on those things. Let me just drill down on two of these things. First one is around building cohesive teams. This is another question that I got when I was interviewed in the book. Is it more important to place your energy on the individual or the team? What do you think my answer was? Both. Here's why. Right? Ultimately, decisions and judgments and actions are taken by individuals, not a team, really. Right? So a leader has to devote time on identifying and develop you know, developing high potential people, of course. But here's the problem. A group of talented, gifted, ambitious individuals don't necessarily equate to being an effective team, right? Exam lots of examples in sports, right? Some of these sports teams that spend gazillion dollars on these top athletes and don't win, right? But it's also true that a team of good intentioned individuals who get along, they like each other, that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to generate extraordinary results. Right? So the point is, as a leader developing teams, you have to develop the individuals. Of course, you have to select and develop individuals that have talents and so forth. But you have to ensure that they're cohesive. What do I mean by cohesive? It's different than teamwork. Let's take a look at the dictionary. Physics, that from attraction by which the particles of a body are united throughout the mass, whether like or unlike. Cohesiveness is different than teamwork. It's a higher level. Here's what I mean. Let me drill down. Team of individuals, right? We all know we're human beings. We all have our different ways of doing things, the way we process information, our personalities. A cohesive team shares the same values, and shares the same purpose. The stuff in between doesn't matter. What? I didn't say it's easy. I said it doesn't matter. If you share the same values and share the same purpose, it doesn't matter. My wife and I, not to get mushy, we're soulmates. OK, so great. We're totally different backgrounds. I come from a family, Greek. My brother and me yell and scream, argue. She's from a Catholic large family, Beaver Cleaver family. You come to the dinner table, everybody's nicey-nicey. If you don't have a smiley face, you're sent to your room. You talk about the weather. I mean, like totally different sort of backgrounds. But we share the same values and the same purpose and dreams for our family. But you got to work it. Got to work it. So what are the behaviors and group dynamics of a cohesive team? Genuine bonding. 
support each other in good times and in bad, right? Unshakable belief that there's only one way we win. That's together. High, high quality of communication, right? Direct, open, frequent, credible. Surfacing and resolving conflict with one overriding goal, solve it and move on. Participation by all, no one on the sidelines. Everyone participates. All parts are connected and working in harmony. Formal hierarchies, organizational boundaries, they don't get in the way of serving clients, of meeting goals, of doing the right thing. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, a sense of something bigger than anyone's own functional area or set of responsibilities. A couple of quick thoughts around building cohesive teams. Most importantly, as a leader, you must not allow failure. Failure is not an option. What do I mean by that? You can't legislate cohesiveness. You can't. But I can tell you what it looks like. I can tell you what my expectations are. I can help coach and train and mentor, but I can't legislate it. So at some point, if I don't have a cohesive team, I got to make change. Failure is not an option. Be clear on expectations. And I'm talking about each one of us on a team have a set of individual responsibilities, right? But we also have a certain set of expectations and responsibilities to be a member of the team. Be clear on that. Insist that every member stand up and be counted. It's been tough on my management team. I have a, an absolute expectation that everyone on this management team participates. That means you got to debate, you got to advance ideas, you got to take me on, right? And it's been hard for a couple folks on the management team. Sorry, you can develop the skills. It's not an option not to participate. That doesn't happen. Provide clarity and context for making decisions. You can see I'm kind of loud and animated, strong personality. So I discovered that when I would go into meetings, my management team automatically thought I had made a decision on something. OK. So I found that I needed to be very clear. Look, a company is not a democracy. There are going to be times that I made a decision. And the CEO I made a decision. So I'm not going to sort of trick the management team in coming around. I've decided. Or I'm leaning this way, but I want debate and participation. Or, you know what, whatever. Let's, I have no orientation one way or another. Now, it also means that, as a member of the team, they have certain responsibilities. You've got to be able to say, I agree with the decision, or I disagree but can live with it, or, you know what, I can't live with this decision. You've got a problem if that's the case, right? You've got to keep working it. Talked a lot about this. You've got to ensure conflict is dealt. I got tons of stories on this one. Conflict resolution, and you have to know when to intervene. About 15 years ago, article in Fortune magazine, the top 10 reasons why CEOs fail. One of them was, they used the phrase, inability to pull the trigger on a senior executive, right? My friend, he's loyal, I'm going to look bad, it's going to be difficult to replace. You have to know when to let someone go. Do it with a big heart, but you got to know when to let someone go. OK, <coughs> let me drill down one other thing before we move on. Communication. The art of communication is a language of leadership. If you think about people in positions of responsibility, CEO, senior executives, whomever, 90% of our time is spent in some kind of interaction, human interaction with someone or some people. So it's no surprise that communication is one of those critical elements and competencies and skills that a leader must do well, very well. Now, what's interesting, there's actually five elements to leader communication, in my judgment. The two are obvious, right? Speaking and writing. And I like this metaphor because if you're effective speaker and writer, your message soars. It reaches many. 
right? It takes flight. This is true. This is true. Effective leaders can communicate through a lot of clutter and across a lot of boundaries. Because this is also true, right? Think about it. As human beings, I don't know what that is, but it is true. When faced with vagueness, we tend to always assume the worst. Now, leadership imperative. You have to develop and hone your written and verbal communications. And by the way, it takes time and practice. It takes time and practice, but you have to make it an incredible high priority. And I'm talking about all of this, yes, all of it. To be an effective leader, you have to be an effective writer and speaker on all of these type of communications, all of them. And it's about providing context and clarity, right? Aristotle um, wrote about the three sort of components of persuasive communication, persuasive and effective communication. He talked about three means, if you will. The first he talked about was ethos. This is the ability to convince through one's character. In other words, we tend to believe those that we trust or that have credibility. Logos, this is the ability to persuade through logic and reason. And pathos, which is the means of persuasion through emotion, right, to inspire imagination or passion. All three components are critical in order to be an effective, persuasive communicator. The third element of communication is observing. Again, we could spend a whole session just on this. When I'm talking about observing, watching, seeing, perceiving, noticing, sensing, that is part of communication. And the last two, listening, that's part of communication, but hearing the unheard. So the point is, and again, we could do a whole session on this, have to sharpen your skills to listen to the spoken. Not easy. Very few people do this well, and even fewer do this. Focus your senses to hear the unheard of your employees, of your clients, of your shareholders. All right, a couple quick thoughts, very quick. I mentioned this already. Got to make it a top priority. We all have 24 hours in a day. You must make this a high priority. Be authentic in your communication. No one writes my words. It's a lot of work, okay? And I'm not talking about an announcement somewhere. Fine, someone can write that for me. I'm talking about if anything I need to communicate that is an issue or a decision made or trying to advance an idea or explain a problem, how can I let someone else write my words? Right? It's got to come from me, from my heart, from my brain, from my gut. And of course, say what you mean and mean what you say. This is a biggie, you guys. You will, this will be a lifelong journey to get this right. Very, very few people do this well. And, you, and we can think of tons of examples in public life uh, about this. Simplify complex ideas and concepts so anyone can understand. Leaders have this uncanny ability. I shouldn't say that. They develop the ability. Some maybe have it naturally. Develop the ability to take even the most complex ideas and thoughts and simplify them. Put in writing for this, right? Put in writing. We've all fallen into this, right? Where we write an email, person down the hall. Not for this, though. Very important principle. When to put in writing and when to go for face-to-face. -face. Be accessible. No, we won't get into that. I, I answer my own phone. It goes back to if you expect to touch people and to understand where they're coming from and to hear them, and inspire them. How can you have filters and gatekeepers? Show your vulnerability. Again, I'm just going to go quickly through these. 
And we talked a lot about this. You've got to develop a swift approach to dealing with, with conflict, especially. Communication is the real work of leadership. Let me quickly go through the last two pieces. So the third domain of this leadership framework is what you inspire. By inspire, I mean the ability to elicit positive behaviors and emotions and actions from people without the, the reward, the promise of a reward or the threat of a punishment. If you think about it, motivation is very different than inspiration. Motivation's source of influence is the carrot and or stick. But inspiration comes from the heart and flows freely and naturally and willingly. Now take a look at these 12 human elements. Their real and pervasive existence is an imperative for any organization that hopes to have enduring success and endurance, regardless of the up and down inevitable cycles of our economy. When I was, um, when I was 15, I had cancer. They gave me six months to live. I have one brother and my dad, of course. And every time they were in front of me, during my surgeries, you know, the radiation treatments, the tubes, all of that, they would break down and cry. They would be despondent. My mother, on the other hand, was always up, always smiling, always referencing the future. What? How can that be? What was she doing? Years later, I realized it hit me what she was doing. By referencing the future, Sorry, you guys, I switched, but let me go to the, let me go to this. By referencing the future and being optimistic, she had a major influence on my recovery. Years later, I found out that this woman who was always smiling, always up, who bolstered my spirits during the day, at night would go somewhere in the house alone with a picture of her mother and would break down and weep uncontrollably. The reason I share this story is, God forbid that any of us have to deal with something like for our kids, for our children. But the fact is, people in position of authority will deal with crisis. It can be something small, or it can be something big. And how we behave and how we give strength and offer hope to others will define who we are, and frankly, will define successful you know, outcomes. The last domain in this leadership framework is what you enable. Right? This is about getting results through others. And enabling is different in many ways. It's different than empowerment. Empowerment is part of enable. Empowerment is you give permission. Enabling is all these other things. Right? Now, in my judgment, there are 10 things, there's lots of things, but 10 fundamental things that a leader must enable within his or her organization in order to assure endurance and long-term success. And these are, again, the fundamentals, we can spend a whole day on this, these are the fundamentals of enabling. I'm going to share another story with you, with my mother again. When I was captain of the safety patrols, when I got sixth grade, my wife always makes fun of me, sixth grade. So it was when I appointed captain of the safety patrols, my mother celebrated as if I had become president of the United States. When I won fourth place in a state track and field meet, she cheered as if I had won a gold Olympic medal. And when I got a good grade on a paper or test, she rejoiced as if I had won the Pulitzer Prize. Not exaggerating, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but not by much. Because instinctively, she knew, right, by celebrating small wins, she was building confidence and self-esteem and giving me the courage to take risks. Well, it's true within organizations. By celebrating these small achievements, Right? We embolden others to take on more risk and to, take, and to achieve bigger achievements. 
So the point is, you guys, you must be and do in all four domains. That's what leadership is, to be and do in all four domains. Last two thoughts. I believe that every leader has a covenant, a pledge, and that's to build leadership capacity in self and in others. And capacity is different than ability. It's so much more. It's so much more. Now, think about the time that you won or earned a big appointment or big promotion. Or for some of you early in your careers, imagine the time where you get that coveted title, that big appointment. Right? Now picture the martial artist kneeling before the master sensei in a ceremony to receive a hard-earned black belt. After years of relentless training, the student has achieved a pinnacle of success. The master sensei says, before granting the belt, you must pass one more test. I'm ready, says the student, thinking that perhaps another round of sparring. You must answer the essential question, what is the true meaning of the black belt? Student immediately comes back, the end of my journey, a well-deserved reward for all of my hard work. The master sensei is waiting for more. He's clearly disappointed. You are not ready to receive the black belt. Come back in one year. The year passes. The student is kneeling before the master sensei. What is the true meaning of the black belt? A symbol of distinction and the highest achievement in the art. The master sensei is still pretty disappointed. You are not ready to receive the black belt. Come back in one year. Year passes. Student is kneeling before the master sensei. What is the true meaning of the black belt? This time the, su the student pauses and reflects and answers. The black belt represents the beginning, the start of a never-ending journey of discipline, work, and the pursuit of an ever higher standard. Yes, you are now ready to receive the black belt and begin your work. I wish you all the best in your own journeys of leadership growth and discovery. Thank you very much. Thank you, Henry, for your inspiring words. Uh, we have time for a couple questions, and we're going to have a longer Q&A session with uh, Harry shortly after 8, but uh, let's have a couple quick questions here. Either come down or stand up and uh, shout. Everyone's tired. One question. Henry, you left them spellbound. <laughs> You know, there's a, that's a great question. So the question was, who's my ethical role model? Um, you know, I, I look a lot to my parents, obviously, and to uh, historical figures, and then people that I've known, you know, throughout. As, um, as I said during my presentation, it is a journey, and it's so much about self-discovery, being exposed to a lot of things, and then taking those lessons, and how you apply those lessons learned. Um, historically, though, to answer your question very specifically, Abraham Lincoln is probably at the top of my list for lots of reasons. Uh, George Washington, Martin Luther King. I mean, there's, there's several historical figures. And, what, and if you're a student of history and you really delve in, it's not that they were perfect. If you read about their, li their life story, it's, it really is a journey of growth and self-discovery. Drew? It's a great question. So why, the, why going from financial investors to employee owned? It's such a great question. Thank you for asking it. You know, it's a fundamental belief 
Um, I've dealt with financial investors, private equity, venture capitalists for, for lots of years, and they're, they're good folks. Um, and we were fortunate enough to have some great financial investors. But the fact is, at least in our business, it's our people who are, through their blood, sweat, and tears, if you will, through their efforts, their commitment, their dedication, that are making it happen. They're the ones who are creating value. So why should outsiders get that benefit? All of our employees should have the opportunity to experience the fulfillment and reap the rewards of ownership. And by the way, our ESOP is such that every employee is equal. That means that I, as a CEO, can't say, well, gee, I'll take 40% or 50 and everybody else can have the rest. No, no, everybody's exactly equal. I'm, seven, I'm the largest owner at 7.5%, and that's only because I was willing to put in more money than anybody else. Somebody else could have been more than me. Everybody's equal. But that's the story. I mean, that's it. It's that our employees deserve the opportunity, if they want, by the way. This is totally optional, but they do put in their own money. Thanks for asking. It's a great question. One last question here. Associations. Yep. Which are often filled with many businesses. Yep. How do you think your leadership style or your expectations can eliminate that? It's a great question. So, so the question was, we, we, uh, our company, we manage professional associations. So what does that mean? So many of you may know, like the American Medical Association, the American Bar Association. Association is a collection of individuals and companies who have something in common, like a particular profession, like heart surgeons, or a particular industry, like the cremation industry, or the pet food industry, or the car wash industry. And they get together under this thing called an association for lots of reasons. It could be to advocate. It could be to share best practices. It could be for education. It could be for networking, for you know, honoring and recognizing achievement. And there's thousands and thousands of associations um, in the United States. In the world, but the United States, we're sort of a unique place for, for association. Our company provides the staff, the paid staff, and the facilities and the resources for these associations. All right, so the question is, so, so it's a great question also, it's that if you think about the success of an association, an association is a services company, and the success depends so much on the quality and commitment of the members of the board who are individual volunteers, right, from that industry or profession. And yes, indeed, it depends so much on their leadership abilities and, and capacities. And that's one of the challenges of our company, is that in any one year, you can have individuals on that board who don't have the skills, uh, may be dysfunctional, right? And in fact, if you think about many organizations, associations, they're not all CEO kind of groups. They could be nurses groups or physicians or attorneys who aren't naturally oriented toward sort of management and leadership. So it's a, it's a real challenge. It's a long answer. I'm getting to the, the punchline. So one of the things, let me back up. Our overarching goal as a company is to build a great, enduring company. Well, OK, Henry, what does that mean? Well, we actually have we've identified 10 measures of greatness. One of them is that we grow leaders not only within our own ranks, but within our client organizations. There's not a lot of companies that have that. Now, are we achieving that perfectly? Absolutely not. In fact, it's a real commitment of mine to have a real organized leadership development program for our board members of our clients. Today we do it sort of, you know, um, not in a real organized fashion, you know, focused way. It's a great question because ultimately it is success about the leadership of those individuals on the board. Which, by the way, our association's client success, by definition, means our success or not. Great question. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. Thank you.